Prologue Newgate Prison had some five hundred years' notoriety. With its bleak depths and merciless masonry, the place had seen men and women beyond count condemned to a dismal life and often death for any and all manner of crimes. It was a harsh stronghold. But even with its black crevices and stonework cold as blood, individuals of times past had at various removes garnered the courage and cunning to liberate themselves of the abasement and oppression of the structure and break out to their freedom. He was one of them, one of three to be exact. The escape had been far less arduous than they had expected. He had been the architect of the riot himself, igniting a slow-brewing, hate-fueled feud between three of the more belligerent and brutish guards and five men with whom he was associated as part of a kind of gang, but none of whom he had any lingering affection for. As such, lighting the tinder was easy, and there was no intention of controlling the burn therein. When hell broke loose, the three made for Tyburn's cell, for the man had been working on the lax iron bar for the better part of a fortnight, and it was primed and ready to merely slide out when the time was right. Below, of course, were the two vixens who had aided in orchestrating the ruse from its inception, having formally seen to it that the guards would be waiting patiently for their satisfaction in the exterior storehouse on the east side of the institution. Tyburn had shattered his leg upon landing, and they had to drag him to the carriage, muffling his screams with a rag. Not long on the road, they decided the man had exhausted his usefulness and disposed of him in the gardens in Whitechapel, the buxom lass being the one to silence him for good and all with a concealed shiv. It was by execution dock at Wapping they did away with the carriage driver. This time it was the blonde who drew her blade across his throat before he could reach his pistol in realizing their subterfuge. It was as he bled and choked as one that Culligan secured the flintlock pistol, and shortly thereafter, the four made their way to the rowboat and headed down river, but not before acknowledging the pirate corpses who swayed lightly in the night's wind from hempen ropes that substantiated the dock's namesake. That'll not be us, Culligan had said. This city'll be behind us before long. The night was hushed and dark enough, the river wider than ample and the current so obliging that they took the women then and there on the rowboat. Culligan had the one with the slick brown curls, and his was the blonde, whose blouse and skirts were still stained with blotch after streak of the driver's blood, which looked black as death in the mist and moonlight. She was noisy, but it was an ecstasy he had longed for too many nights past, and he cared not how loud or whispered or pleasured or pained her cries were. It was hard for him to keep going without a belt or a rope around his neck, but he made it to the end, occasionally reaching to his throat with his own hand, which went unnoticed. A while after it was done and he had singularly taken over navigation and oarsmanship, Culligan leveled the pistol at the ladies' heads and expostulated, Best be swimming away now, my dears. The girls were taken aback and loathe at his curt disposition, the brunette spiking back. You'll take us to the shore at Blackwell Yard, as was the arrangement, you vile dog. Do you like your brains intact, milady? was Culligan's retort. Well, I never, shot back the golden-haired girl. Some man of your word you are, sly. Your recompense will still be awaiting you there, sweetheart. You'll just be wetter, is all. It was only as the two of them passed Blackwall some time later that Culligan had said to him, You just never know. They may have squealed if we let them off on land. Just a bit of cold in the water for a time, that's all. Besides, I don't do women. They had rowed a short while longer, Culligan polishing the flintlock with his shirt and looking about suspiciously before eventually endeavoring to ask, I was always wondering, but you never said, how many women was it that you did in anyway? Did in? You mean killed? I killed. You know I'm a wronged man, Culligan, he said back, and I don't discriminate. Right, of course. It's just... They started to find more bodies. Girls, you know. Have they? Aye, they have. Well, you know, that can't have had anything to do with me. I've been locked up with you this whole time. Aye, that's true. Should we have done away with them back there? Did you ever give them our names? When? You've been with me all along. Since we broke out, I mean. During any of your correspondence? No, I didn't give them any names. What about in your letters to Adeline? No, I gave no names just an account of our repute. Well, not Tyburn, of course, just you and me. The way it's always been, the way it's supposed to be, 
Look at us now. Culligan had been as unbearable on the remainder of the journey as he had been for the past two years in Newgate. When he ate, he chomped. When he snored, his dry snout ruffled like a pig, and above all else, he talked too much. Whether it was besides the hedge by the edge of the track, the rocky sand under the roadside bridge, or among the cluster of trees that just about constituted a wood, the man couldn't shut up at night, blathering on about the pirates and pirate ships, treasures and escapades, and what roguery and triumph awaited them. One night they quested for respite from a storm and found an empty barn off the road between Raynham and Rochester, and Culligan insisted on reading the letter for the umpteenth time as he had been at work trying to get the fire going. Mates, it says, I mean that's an all right place to start, but we can go further in that and quick like. It says it right here. There's ample opportunities for advancement upon evidenced application of skills newly obtained and refined to a suitably expedient degree. The man could read, he would give him that. Most of the inmates in Newgate he had known couldn't, Tyburn included. It was one of the reasons he wasn't with them now and all the long thought the letter to contain information's entirely alternate. What do you think, though? Culligan went on. I haven't seen this one in years. Only ever spent time together as saplings, anyway. Odd job here, little game there. I suppose he's not the one wrote the invite, but he was the one always said we should be at sea, privateering and the like. I told him privateering and being a pirate ain't the same thing. He said he understood, but I think he never did. You think they'd be plucking people out of jails up and down the country? I wouldn't think so. I mean, might as well jaunt on up to Bedlam and see what sort of lunatics in there want to join up with a pirate fleet. Nah, not likely. They was looking for special types, such as you and me, sparky-like, intelligent. They dipped south after Raynham and kept off the roads, roughing it on the Kent Downs for two further days till they had made their destination. In Dover, they pilfered some grub in broad daylight, Culligan going so far as to point the flintlock at an unruly fish merchant, before he dragged the fool away and they made their escape in a wooded area in the shadow of the castle. A short while later they had made it in sight of the white cliffs. They were, as he had heard them described, an immense wall of shocking white, jagged and jarring, a chalk bulwark that stretched beyond sight. How about that, eh? Culligan had said upon the discovery. The ship wasn't visible from there, so they had had to head north and east, following the coastline, until around about Crab Bay, wherein they could make out the dim shape some ways out at sea, stationary and steel. Upon reaching a jut in the land where the view was most clean and clear, he and Culligan finally stopped, and took a moment to breathe in the halcyon stillness of their success. We made it, Culligan said now with obvious satisfaction. I told you we would, didn't I tell you? That's her. No mistake. Adeline. She's a schooner, you see. He was pointing to the solitary vessel, then stepped to the edge of the cliff and craned his neck over and down. Blimey, bugger me, that's a long way down. Now, bloodhound, that's a brigantine. We won't get close to her, not yet. But if we put in the elbow grease and all that, learn the rigging works and ties and splices, won't be long before that Frenchman captain calls us up. You know what they call him, right? You mentioned. Right. And that's where we want to be. That's who we want to be sailing under. And from there, who knows what? Anything. You erred. We can have new names and all. Just think about it now, the two of us, captain and quartermaster, we could start our own fleet. Who's who? Culligan stepped back from the edge, looked at him briefly, then back out at the ship. Well, we'll figure that out when we get to it. Now we've got to find a way down. It says they send a rowboat to the shore every night when the moon is full up. Question is, where on the shore? With any luck, we got here in time. Doesn't look like it's going anywhere. It's at anchor now, is why. We were on the road, what, four days? If this is the fifth, we're in time. Then she's sailing back to the Bloodhound? Aye, that's right. And you know which other ship Bloodhound is affiliated with? No. An even bigger one, Squire. A real beast. I'm talking man of war, or giant East Indiaman kind of thing. The sort of place you and me could do real well on. But one thing at a time, though, eh? Can't call ourselves pirates yet. Not till we're about that one. Culligan stepped back to the cliff edge and peered down again, glanced around. Tell you what, though, weren't I right about this place and all? The white cliffs? They'll look even better from on the ship sailing away. First thing I'm gonna do is find myself some cunny and rum. 
They'll have snatch on the ships, won't they? They say there's no women allowed on board, but that's Navy and the like. Pirates do what they want. You'll see. I know. Well, you were right about one thing, he said, finally losing patience and sensing opportunity, stepping towards Culligan quick and calm, close enough he could smell the fish and fear on the man's mouth as he turned around with glassy, suddenly terrified eyes. It is a long way down, 